taunt somebody with a subpoena. I mean, these are lawyers. They can throw this stuff around all the time. But it goes to show that the SEC is lawless. They refuse to submit to oversight. So it's like a rebellious child, you know, it's like grow up and get out. In a, and in the spirit in Congress today, they're starting an impeachment inquiry on Biden. They're probably going to start one pretty soon on Attorney General Garland. And don't be surprised if we go after the SEC chairman as well, you know, for his contempt of Congress. I mean, it's a really, really interesting situation brewing. Next year is going to be a wild ride. Well, I want to welcome you to our episode of the Clinton Donnelly Show today. Today, I'm going to talk to my crypto experts in-house, David Canedo, and we're going to talk over some of the current and hot topics that we're seeing in the crypto sphere and how they affect regulation and taxes. And as always, please hit subscribe, like, follow, and share this video with other people. Thanks very much, and hope you enjoy it. Why don't we start with Gary Gensler? September 26th, uh, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler, he testified in front of the House Financial Services. And uh, to say that it was controversial is an understatement. Uh, the, the Chairman Patrick McHenry, uh, along with a number of uh, Tom Emmer, just so many people drilled him. And a lot of perplexing uh, statements that he made. One of the ones that I want to talk about is specifically who asked him this? Torres asked him, um, basically, is buying a Pokemon card a security? No. How about buying a tokenized Pokemon card? That is a security, apparently. What do we think about this? Well, in the Howey test, I think there was a distinction made between uh, a contract for purchasing, I think there was an orange orchard, and uh, and whether or not, and, and the orange, orange trees themselves. And I think what was sold in the Howey test was an investment in orange trees, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that itself became an investment contract. So when you tokenize something, is it not something that has a smart contract wrapped around it? So you could tease that out. Of course, you know, that's probably a, a subtlety that Gary Gensler couldn't uh, put his hands around. But, yeah, I think there's an issue. Is what is it an investment contract when I've tokenized it? I mean, it is definitely perplexing because when you listen to his answer, at least if you only look at the short, it very much seems like he is targeting the tokenized part of it. Because it's like, wait, how is the, you know, the traditional Pokemon card not a security? But then as soon as you tokenize it, uh, and I think that's kind of what, you know, what Representative Richie Torres was kind of, you know, and the whole internet's kind of reacting to. Um, further, we saw that Chairman McHenry ask him if Bitcoin is a security. It seemed like a fairly simple answer. Now he said no. It, it, he said, it, this is not a trick question. But then he asked him, okay, so if it's not a security, then it's a commodity, right? And Gensler kind of retracted back to his, well, you have to look at the purpose, you know, the investment purpose and everything. So why is he so hesitant to just give us anything? Well, I thought it was interesting. I, I, I can't answer that. I thought it was very interesting that, uh, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, that uh, the the first attack on the Pokemon, that, that, was, that we're actually starting to see some really t crypto savvy questions coming from representatives. Okay. I think that's the impact of the, of, of a lot of people, including the Chamber of Digital Commerce, educating politicians, helping them understand the subtleties so they can start pushing back on this stuff. Uh, secondly, I think what I saw uh, in one of the quotes on the Chairman McHenry, who is a crypto friend, he basically took the uh, Gensler, he threatened Gensler. He said, look, we're an oversight body and you're not sharing any documents with us. You're not sharing anything that we ask for. You're not sharing anything. And like, you're going to force me to actually issue a subpoena to get these documents. This will be the first time a subpoena has ever been issued on the SEC from this committee. And it would be against you. You know, and he, he got very, now, I, I mean, I come on, taunt somebody with a subpoena. I mean, I, they, you know, these are lawyers. They can throw this stuff around all the time. But, uh, but it goes to show that the SEC is lawless. They refuse to uh, submit to oversight. So it's like a rebellious child, you know. It's like you know, grow up and get out, you know. And in the spirit in Congress today, I mean, we're looking at a, 
you know, they're, they're starting an impeachment uh, inquiry on Biden. They're probably going to start one pretty soon on Attorney General Garland. And don't be surprised if we go after the SEC chairman as well, you know, for uh, his contempt of Congress. I mean, it's a really, really interesting situation brewing. Next year is going to be a wild ride. Yeah, Chair Gensler, I have a series of uh, questions that require a yes or no answer. And in the interest of my limited time, I'd appreciate it if you would comply with that. Uh, Mr. Gensler, is it fair to say generally that large institutions in any given industry benefit more from regulatory uncertainty than everyday market participants or smaller institutions who don't have the scale or the capital to fund expensive compliance teams? Uh, large institutions could benefit uh, from uncertainty. Reclaiming my time. The answer is yes, sir. Mr. Gensler, you had an 18-year career at Goldman Sachs where you were partner and co-head of finance, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. And is it correct to say that you made most of your personal wealth directly through your employment at this bank, bank Goldman Sachs? Um, I've done well since then, too, sir. I'll take that as a yes as well. You described the SEC under your leadership as the cop on the beat watching out for our constituents, constituents, correct? I think that's a mandate that Congress Yeah, and I think you've us. said that, reclaiming my time. The answer is yes, sir. If you could just comply with what I've asked, I'd appreciate it. But given your 18-year career at one of the biggest banks in the world and the personal financial fortune you amassed there, do you think it's possible for you to serve as an impartial regulator and not favor large financial inst intermediaries? Absolutely, sir. Well, reaction. Well, it's my opinion that Goldman Sachs predominantly drives the Department of Treasury altogether. Uh, I mean, if you look at the number of secretaries of the Treasury that have worked for Goldman Sachs, uh, and sometimes after being secretaries, they go back to Goldman Sachs. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs has significant influence in how this country is run financially. And they're very proud of that. You know, the fact that they're calling it out. I mean, at the same time, you could you could make this argument kind of that we need. Uh, that finances are complicated and we need smart people running it. And these smart people tend to go work at companies like Goldman Sachs or Citibank or Bank of America or Chase or JP Morgan. That this is where the smart people go and this is where they make a difference. And you need those people to run things like the SEC. So you can argue it both ways. I found it kind of interesting, though, that, you know, when he, he said, um, you know, and it is correct, you made most of your personal wealth directly through employment there. And then he smirks as he says, I've done pretty well since then. I mean, good for him. It is just kind of, you know, I think when you look into the different, uh, depending what side of the coin you're on, you know, there are some conspiracy theories, but can you really regulate an industry when there's so much uh, is the interest from the incumbents are so big, you know, can you really be can he be neutral and regulating? And I think that's the biggest concern that a lot of people have because as we're seeing, it doesn't seem like he is being neutral, at least to the, you know, just the, the somebody observing uh, from the outside. I think that's the challenge because if you're good in a particular industry, you may, you, you know, you're going to be excelling, you're going to rise to the top uh, and eventually you're going to go over to the government and serve there for a period of time. I mean, think about, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Well, a lot of those people working there come from the pharmaceutical industry or the large agricultural industries, you know, or, and, and, and then they, they, and they go back. Uh, I think there's a perception, and it's probably true, that these people have uh, golden strings, that they know they're just doing time at the SEC, at the FDA, or at the EPA, but they're going back to these big companies that are going to pay them big bucks for the influence that they provided while they were there. You know, this is how you could continue to do well after you left the bank. Now, I don't think he does what he wants. I think he's, I think he's in cahoots with certain power brokers in that industry to, to work out a plan. I don't think it's all Gary, but that's the issue we have in politics today. These aren't politicians, these are bureaucrats that just do what they want. I mean, anybody else find it ironic if we want to keep going deeper into the hearing? Um, 
Chairman McHenry said, and I quote, your lack of responsiveness to this committee's legitimate oversight continues to be unacceptable. He talking about FTX. He says, um, seven months into it, the SEC has not produced a single non-public document. The SEC is not above the law. Other financial regulators have routinely complied with congressional oversight. I do not want to be the first chairman of this committee to issue a subpoena to the SEC, and you should not want to be the first SEC chair to receive a subpoena. I mean, those are, those are, I don't think he was stuttering. He, those are very stern words. And as we all know, there's a lot of, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's a lot of smoke about Gary Kensler's involvement talks, how much he met with the SPF and what his potential, you know, his potential role in the whole FTX. Uh, and I think obviously, you know, he has to show a very tough uh, regulatory side of him now to make sure that he, oh no, I'm being tough on crypto, right? But he did let FTX happen right under his watch. Well, yeah, I mean, well, if he, if he gives false information, then, I mean, you're demanding documents. And, and of course, he's a lawyer. They're all lawyers. And when you're a lawyer, you're effectively an agent of the court and you have legal responsibilities to do. So they have all this responsibility, you know, and if the Financial Services Committee wants to go after Skeletor, by all means, do it. So I think that's a nice pivot to go into the government shutdown. So if we would have been doing this a couple of days ago, we might have been talking about what the implications of a government shutdown might have been. It looks like uh, it got, you know, we avoided the government shutdown by um, signing a bill right before the deadline. Uh, the Senate voted 88 to 9 to pass the measure to avoid the shutdown. And it looks like basically, uh, what is it, 45 days, if I'm not mistaken, that um, this is basically extending it to, yes, the House voted 335 to 91 to fund the government through November 17th. So the question is, are we out of the woods yet or what? happens next well government shutdowns it's just a power game they that 45 days puts it past the uh, november election i'm not sure how many people are subject to a november election this, it's an off year but you know it, it, it kicks the can down the road i guess what's going to happen between now and then i i can't i have i have no idea what they're expecting to have happen i mean a lot of things could happen really all right thank you very much for listening to this show i hope you have found it interesting and as always Remember, taxes are sexy. The Clinton Donnelly Show, where we explore how taxation and regulations of cryptocurrencies affect your daily life as an investor. Clinton has a law degree in international financial regulation. He is an enrolled agent and certified as a cryptocurrency anti-financial crime specialist. He has clients in 71 countries. He is one of the top experts in crypto taxation in the US. This show is sponsored by CryptoTaxAudit.com, the income tax experts for US crypto investors. Are you frustrated with using online crypto tax services to calculate capital gains? Are you a high frequency trader, DeFi, NFT, play to earn or quail mm. investor? Nothing is too complicated for the experts at CryptoTaxAudit.com. Are you frustrated that your accountant doesn't understand crypto taxes? Crypto Tax Audit uses a proven, bulletproof crypto tax return methodology to prepare a tax return that doesn't attract the attention of the IRS. Crypto Tax Audit also offers an exclusive audit defense membership service. It's like car insurance for your tax return. If your return gets selected for an audit of crypto reporting, they will defend you at no additional charge for the entire life of the audit. No one offers anything like audit defense membership. Go to CryptoTaxAudit.com to learn more and schedule a private tax consultation now. The opinions expressed in this show are not legal advice. Tax and regulations are complicated. Your situation is unique so you should always consult a tax professional.